Ladies and gentlemen, very welcome to the LSE for this night's event, um, organized by the Financial Markets Group at the Law School, uh, School of Economics. My name is Professor Ulf Axelsen, and I'm the, the director of the Financial Markets Group. And I'm here to introduce our two prominent guests tonight, which is Lord Adair Turner and Robert Peston. So if you come up on stage, I'll give a quick introduction. <laughs> so the event tonight will be covering essentially Lord Turner's new book, which is called Between Death and the Devil, Money, Credit, and Fixing Global Finance. And uh, he and Robert Pester will have a conversation about this. And essentially, I've been promised that you will tell us how we're going to solve all the world's problems within the next 40 minutes. Um, for those of you who don't know these famous gentlemen, um, Lord Turner um, has basically done everything in business and public policy and academia. Um, maybe most importantly in terms of the topic that we're talking about today, Lord Turner took over as a chair of the Financial Services uh, Authority was it the day after Lehman Brothers collapsed? Five uh, days. Five days after. So essentially to sort out the mess of the financial crisis. Um, and uh, you did that for a number of years. And Lord Turner has then been a big part of kind of devising the new regulatory system for, uh, for banks. Um, Lord Turner is now the chair of INET, the Institute for new economic thinking, and as I take it, also a visiting professor at the London School of Economics. I am, yes. <laughs> um, and we are very happy to have Robert Peston here, who is a distinguished uh, journalist and author, um, and who used to be the economic editor at the BBC until a few days ago or something, and well, I'm still technically, okay. but, I'm, <laughs> okay. but I'm going over That's to our another jump, place. <laughs> jump shot to somewhere else, uh, as, I, as I take it. Um, now, uh, there will be a chance to ask questions after these gentlemen are done. Um, and after the event, there will also be a book signing outside. Um, so you should buy as many books as you, as you can. Um, I should also say this is a public event which has a hashtag somewhere, so you can do your Twittering. The hashtag is hashtag LSE Finance, but you're not allowed to have your mobiles on any volume, so please turn off the volume so you don't disturb, uh, disturb the event. I should also say that the, the event will be um, recorded so hopefully we will be able to make this event available on podcast later on. But now I want to hand over to our speakers. Well, great to see all of you here. It's a great pleasure uh, to be uh, chairing this event. I've known uh, Adair oh, no, it's sort of more than 20 years, I think. Um, I think we first... Uh, Cross paths when I was political editor of the FT and you were uh, director general of the CBI. And the, um, the great thing about Adair, the reason um, you know, I'm immensely fond of him, is his intellectual confidence mm -hmm. and his um, tremendous ability to admit when he's got something wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the reasons I love this book, which I absolutely do commend to all of you, is there is no better exposition of how the financial, business, government, regulatory establishment got so many enormously important things wrong over many, many years. And more importantly, um, it provides some compelling ideas for how to reform the financial and economic systems to make them more stable, to make them better able to serve our interests. Now we're going to divide 
the evening into a couple of parts, or three parts, in fact. Adair's going to run through some of his arguments. I'm then um, going, in a very self-indulgent way, to press him on a few points of interest to me. And then um, I'm going to throw it open to all of you. What, what would be brilliant, because I want to get as many of you involved as possible, um, and I know this is deeply unfair from somebody like myself who plainly loves hearing the sound of his own voice. I'd be really grateful <laughs> if you could ask questions rather than making long discursive statements. I know this is a subject of passionate interest to all of us, but we're here really to, to get Adair's take on it. And I will be savage if I find that you're going on too long. Um, so over to you. Right. Robert, thank you uh, very much. Uh, indeed, and good evening, everybody. Uh, as Ulf has already said, I became chairman of the UK Financial Services Authority uh, on the morning, actually, of Saturday, uh, September the 20th, uh, 2008, five days after Lehman Brothers had collapsed. And only 17 days later, I was sitting with Mervyn King, the Governor of the Bank of England, and Alistair Darling, then the Chancellor of the Exchequer, on one side of the table, and on the other side of the table, uh, we had the major chairman and chief executives of our major banks, and we were discussing the fact that we were effectively going to have to part nationalise two of them. Uh, we ended up owning 85% of Royal Bank of Scotland and 45% of Lloyd's HBOS. It was an extraordinary autumn 2008, which I will never forget, because essentially what happened in that week after Lehman Brothers collapsed was that the entire global banking and financial system was in danger of just coming apart, seizing up. All sorts of markets that we would believe would always work effectively just didn't work at all. And without extraordinary emergency measures, we would have faced not only what we have faced, which is many years of slow growth and only slow recovery, we would have faced an even dra dramatic Great uh, Depression. By early 2009, we'd got through the period of emergency dealing with the crisis, and our brains, our minds turned to what do we need to do to reduce the probability of such a crisis occurring in future. And for four and a half years of my life, I played a major role in the re-regulation of the global banking system. I was the chair of the, what was called the Policy Committee of the International Financial Stability Board, which was the board charged by the G20, the political leadership, to come up with a new plan. And I spent uh, year after year, day after day, month after month of my life uh, in windowless rooms in Basel in particular, uh, debating the details of the Basel III new capital standards, liquidity standards, resolution plans, etc. And I think we did an okay job. I was a hawk in all of those debates. I was always arguing for higher capital standards, tighter liquidity standards. But at the end of the day, international regulations are a negotiation. But I still think we did okay in terms of the stability of the financial system itself. I think we are now significantly less likely than 2007 and 8 to suddenly suffer the emergence of a financial crisis in which one bank goes down and then we're threatened with another bank going down and there's what's called liquidity runs and a sudden dry up of liquidity. I think we've made reasonable progress in terms of the stability of the financial system itself. But I think, and increasingly I came to believe, over those four and a half years after 2009, while I was still at the FSA, I came to believe that what we were doing was really skimming the surface of the causes of instability in modern economies and that we had to go back to some far more fundamental issues to understand fundamentally why 2008 occurred and in particular why 2008 has been followed by these seven years of very slow growth, very slow recovery. And just remember how poor this recovery has been. In Europe, GDP per capita, living standards, income per capita is not back to the level of 2007 across the Eurozone. In the UK, it's only about 1% above where it was in 2007. 1% growth over eight years, whereas we used to believe that that would tend to grow at 1.5% to 2% every year. In the US, it's a bit higher, but it's still 10 or 15% below where it would have been on the pre-crisis trend. This is a massive setback to what we thought was the ability of capitalism year after year 
to deliver significant increases in living standards. And a lot of our assumptions about the world have simply been broken. Nobody thought in January 2009 that seven years later we'd still have interest rates effectively at zero but still be discussing how to stimulate our economies and in Japan and Euro the Eurozone talking about whether we need even more quantitative easing. So the question is, what happened? What happened in 2008 and why has it taken too long to recover? I think the most fundamental cause of what happened is summed up on the chart which I put on figure one, two of the book, which shows the increase in private debt. This isn't public debt, this isn't government debt, but private debt, which across all the advanced economies together, went from 50% of national income of GDP in 1950 to 170% by 2007, and grew every single, almost every single year across that 57-year-old period with an acceleration over the last 20 years. I believe that that growth of debt and the problems that are created then when we then have a crisis and a debt overhang are the fundamental explanation of the travails that we have. But what is interesting is that before the crisis, in academia, there was very little concern about that growth of leverage. Broadly speaking, if I can define the attitude at two ends of the academic corridor, what I'll call the finance theorist and the macroeconomic theorist, this growth of leverage was either welcome <coughs> or completely irrelevant. Down at the finance uh, end, there were lots of finance theorists and economic historians who were able to tell us why we needed debt contracts as well as equity contracts, and who were able to tell us that there were some countries in the world that didn't have enough credit. And in so far as the finance theorists and the economic historians were worried about anything, it was countries like India, where private credit to GDP was only 10%, and people said you need financial deepening. You need a higher level of leverage to run a good economy. There was almost no thinking about the fact that you could have too much debt. Meanwhile, down at the other end of the academic corridor, among the modern macroeconomists, there was basically an attitude that um, debt, banks, the finance system, completely irrelevant. Nothing apparently to do with the macroeconomy. Uh, we could have macroeconomic models which didn't have a bank anywhere in sight. The financial system was described as a veil through which the interest rate passed in some magic fashion, completely unaffected by the financial system. And we ended up believing that as long as we achieved one thing with one instrument, low and stable inflation delivered by the manipulation of the interest rate, as long as we achieved that, low and stable inflation, all would be well, and you could pretty much ignore anything going on in the financial system. I think those two assumptions were fundamentally flawed, and at the root of why they were flawed was two things that economics and finance has said about banking systems and debt, which are fundamentally mythological. We say that banks take money that exists and lend it on, to entrepreneurs and businesses to fund capital investment. Two problems with that statement. Banks don't take money which already exists. They create credit, money, and purchasing power that did not previously exist. And secondly, in advanced economies, the vast majority of what they do is not lending money to fund new capital investment. Indeed, my calculation for the UK is that's about 15% of what our modern banking systems does. The vast majority of what they do is to lend money either to fund consumption or to fund essentially the purchase of assets that already exist. And in particular, real estate and essentially, because this is where the value really lies, the land on which the real estate sits. 60 or 70 percent of the activities of all modern advanced banking systems <coughs> is about financing a competition between ourselves for the ownership of an asset which is in deeply inelastic supply and which in some sense is irreproducible. Now why does it matter? This matters because this can generate very strong credit and asset price booms. If it's fundamentally being lent, new banking credit is being lent against assets which are inelastic supply, then all that happens when you lend more money is that the price of assets though go up and when the price of those assets go up, that reinforces in the minds of both <coughs> lenders and borrowers 
the idea that it might be a good idea to lend and borrow some more money, in which case the price goes up more. And we get these incredibly strong cycles of credit and asset prices, in particular real estate prices, which are not just part of the story of instability in modern advanced economies. They are again and again the whole of the story. We should have known that before 2008 because we had a canary in the mine and the canary was Japan. And Japan also illustrates the dangers that then occur when eventually confidence cracks, when we have what some people call a Minsky moment after the great, great but largely ignored uh, economist uh, Hyman Minsky. After that Minsky moment, which in Japan happened in 1990, and for the rest of us happened in 2008, we enter an environment where debt never really goes away. It simply shifts around the economy and where all our policy levers appear to be stuck. It doesn't go away because after the crisis breaks, you have a whole load of private sector actors, whether they be companies or households, who feel that they're over leveraged and are determined to pay down their debt. And they cut their investment, if they're a company, their consumption, if they're a household, and the economy then moves into a recession. Once the economy moves into a recession, public deficits automatically increase. They increase because tax revenues go down and social expenditures like unemployment benefits go up. And that's useful in the immediate aftermath of the crisis because as the private sector deleverages, the public sector is providing demand. But the trouble with that is that over time we face a rise in public sector debt and we begin to worry about that. And again, Japan is the clearest example of what had already occurred but even before 2008. Between 1990 and 2010, <coughs> corporate leverage in Japan comes down from 140% of GDP to 100%, but public leverage, public debt to GDP, goes from 50% to 250% and it is still rising. It's as if you're on a sort of waterbed and you, know, you press down on one side and the other side gets up, but actually the whole level goes up over time. And since 2008, that pattern that debt doesn't go away, it simply shifts around the economy, has been repeated in all the advanced economies. And I show on various exhibits uh, in the book how that is true for all the advanced economies together, but even more so for the whole world, because what's happened at the whole world level is that while there's been a slight slowdown in the pace of increase of indebtedness in advanced economies, not a fall, but a slight slowdown in the pace of increase, that has been offset by a dramatic increase in indebtedness in emerging economies and above all in China. And again, that's not just you know a chance, that's not just a coincidence, the very reason why China unleashed a huge credit boom in 2009 was because it felt it had to to make up for the deleveraging and the depression which was occurring in the rest of the world. So when we create too much debt, and when we create too much debt in particular not to fund new capital investment but to fund real estate, we end up in an environment where the debt doesn't go away, it just moves around different sectors of the economy. And we end up in an environment where it appears that all our policy levers are blocked. Private sector's deleveraging, public sector ends up with a deficit, seems useful, we want to do it. Some people would say we should still do more of it, people like Larry Summers, Paul Krugman, but most people start worrying about the rise in public debt. So after a while, we start saying, no, we've got to get the public debt under control, we have austerity, we have fiscal consolidation, but that then would drive the economy into a recession because you've got the public debt trying to reduce its indebtedness at the same time as the private debt. So we say, oh, no, no, we've got the magic answer to that. We'll combine fiscal consolidation with ultra-loose monetary policy. An ultra-loose monetary policy, you keep the interest rate uh, close to zero. You do quantitative easing to bring down the long-term interest rates as well as short-term interest rates. You do fancy, complicated things called forward guidance, which tell people that interest rates are going to stay low for many years. But the trouble with all those mechanisms is it's a little bit unclear in economic theory precisely how they get through to the real economy. And en route to the real economy, they can actually have some pretty adverse side effects. <coughs> if they work at all, they probably work by increasing asset prices and then inducing people who feel a bit richer 
or companies which have a slightly higher equity price to go out and invest and to consume a bit more. But that very process tends to increase inequality because the ownership of assets is very concentrated in societies. And as I'll come back to in a minute, rising inequality may be part of the reasons why we got into this mess in the first place. And above all, the essence of the irony of trying to get out of this mess through ultra-loose monetary policy is it's only ever really going to work if we re-stimulate people to borrow yet more money in future. And yet if we got into this mess with too much borrowing, that's a pretty odd way to try and get out. I mean, as a cure to a hangover, that's like a very, very stiff drink. So there are problems with ultra-loose monetary policy, and it seems that we're blocked, that, as it were, people start saying, we're out of ammunition. We can't do anything to stop these deflationary trends around the economy. Well, that's my analysis of the situation which we're in. But finally, to conclude, that then implies two sets of issues for public policy. One of which is, what do we do, or what should we have done in 1980 or 1990, not to get into this mess in the first place? And the other is, given that we are in this mess, what on earth do we do to get out of it? In terms of what we do to run our economies with less leverage and with less credit growth, I set out a set of answers which include some things that you might think are not necessarily to do with the financial system. I argue that some of the reasons why we've ended up with economies which appear to need endless sort of boosts, sort of, you know, uh, injections of credit to keep going is that they've become more unequal societies. I won't explain why, but read the book. More unequal societies tend to need more credit in order to keep going. It's to do with huge global imbalances between current account surplus countries and deficit countries. A country like Germany now running a current account surplus of 7% of GDP. Somewhere, elsewhere, that's going to be matched by a rising level of leverage. And it's to do with the role of property and real estate in modern economies. So we have to address those fundamentals. We can't leave everything to the financial regulators. But if you focus on the financial regulators and central banks, we also ought to be doing a whole number of things. We ought to be running banks with much, much higher capital requirements uh, than we currently have. I spent uh, four years debating with colleagues around the world to see whether we could drag up the capital ratio from sort of five to five and a half to seven. If I were the benevolent dictator of a greenfield economy, I'd set it at about 20%. Unfortunately, I'm not, both because there's no greenfield economies around and because I'm not a benevolent dictator. I would be benevolent if I was a dictator. I mean, <laughs> just, want to be, just want to be clear on that. But, um, so, but, but that is a, the principle. We also need a whole series of what's called <coughs> macroprudential tools by which central banks can lean <coughs> against these credit and asset price bubbles before they produce problems. So there's a set of the book, part four, which is about what do we do about these problems and on the way up, how do we prevent them? And then part five is, well, what the hell are we going to do given where we are at the moment? And there I make a very radical argument. I argue that when we have too much debt in our economy, or if in addition we are suffering from what Larry Summers has called a secular stagnation, and that is a hypothesis that I take seriously, and we can come back to that if you want. In that environment, I think we can enter a, a situation where there is so much debt in the world that we're not going to get out of it simply by growing our way out of it. We're going to have to choose between writing off that debt, and by the way, anybody who thinks that Greek government debt write-offs are already complete <coughs> hasn't looked at the figures. More of that debt's going to be written off. So there's debt write-offs, there's living pretty much forever with zero interest rates and, you know, trying to uh, get out of the debt that way. Or there's what's called overt monetization of the debt. The central bank buys the government debt and essentially writes it off. Now, that is, in economics, a taboo option. You're not meant to say that. The moment you say that, you've proved that you are a very, very dangerous person. But... I feel a very good dangerous person uh, with some, uh, some good company because one of the persons who said it most clearly in economic history was Milton Friedman, 
not normally thought of as a mad left-wing socialist lover of inflation. <laughs> but he said very clearly several times, if we face these profound deflationary problems, the way out is helicopter money, it is printing money. And I make the argument, and I am now completely convinced, that there is no technical reason whatsoever why we cannot use overt monetary finance of fiscal deficits, monetization of debt. It will undoubtedly stimulate the economy in a way that no other tool would. And there is no reason whatsoever why in technical terms it will necessarily need lead to hyperinflation, as some people suggest. We can calibrate how much we do of this in order to have the effect we want. But there are huge political risks to it. And the risks are essentially that once we realize it's possible, we'll do it to excess. And that, to end, is why the book is called Between Debt and the Devil. Because back in autumn 2012, Jens Weidmann, the president of the Bundesbank, gave a speech in which he became pretty close to suggesting that Mario Draghi was growing some horns. <laughs> um, Jens was worried about the possible ECB program of quantitative easing. And he made a speech in which he referred to a famous bit of German literature, uh, to Wolfgang von Goethe's Faust Part Two, in which the devil, Mephistopheles, and we can see him in the top right corner uh, of the book cover, tempts the emperor and says, in your budget expenditures, you don't need to be constrained by how much tax revenue you've got or whether people will lend money. You can print as much money as you want. And of course, that temptation could lead to hyperinflation, but appropriately used, it doesn't need to. And the reason why I called my book Between Death and the Devil is the following. I think we have to realize that if you think about two ways of creating enough nominal demand to grow an economy, there are two ways, each of which is possible, each of which has advantages, and each of which is potentially dangerous. One of them is for money, is for governments to create money and to print money and to stimulate the economy. Feasible in small quantities to get us out of crisis, dangerous if we do too much. We need to balance it, we need to constrain it. The other is private credit creation by the banking system. Before the crisis, we had a philosophy that anything to do with sovereigns printing money was very, very dangerous. But as for what the private sector did in creating credit money and purchasing power, whatever they did was okay. That's not the situation. They both have advantages, they're both technically possible, and they both are potentially dangerous. And that's why we are stuck, as it were, between death and the devil. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, <coughs> Adele. There's a lot of crunchy stuff um, to get our teeth into. I'm just going to start uh, with your um, unbelievably uncontroversial proposal uh, that uh, we should allow write-offs of debt. I mean, essentially, the proposal that, that Adair comes up with is that um, the, the government should think of some way of spending our money usefully. I think you, you use the example about 35 billion quid's worth. Uh, you know, it might be a tax cut, it might be spending on hospitals, and the Bank of England would issue the notes, as it were, to the government, in return for which the government would issue to the Bank of England a perpetual uh, IOU at zero interest. And so in that sense, you know, this is completely free money. Now, um, Historically, the conventional view is you can't do that because at that point people would lose all confidence in the role of the central bank to, pr to protect in any sense the value of the currency and you would become uh, a sort of leper in the international financial system and people would just dump, for example, if you did it in this country, dump sterling. Now, I think there is a very powerful argument that if you set very clear rules and you leave it to an independent central bank to determine what the requisite amount of pure money creation would be, that one might get over 
um, this horror that many have for this kind of approach. I think you make a compelling case. I suppose that there's a sort of practical issue, quite apart from the rules that you'd have to put around it in an individual country, whether any country individually ought to take the risk of going first or whether one could only do this if there was a consensus among a large number of, I mean, there are quite a few heavily indebted countries at the moment, particularly developed economies, whether you could only do it by international consensus. I think that's a very interesting point. I mean, just to pick up on your point, Robert, you're absolutely right that I argue in the book that if we are going to use this option, we need to have a clearly defined set of rules and responsibilities which would convince ourselves that having tasted this medicine once, we won't go back to the honeypot again and again and again until we have hyperinflation. And my specific recommendation, which I'm going to be repeating again at a paper that I'm delivering at the IMF Research uh, Conference in two weeks' time, is that it would be absolutely possible in the UK to give to the Monetary Policy Committee the authority to say, we believe that at this point in the cycle, the most efficient way to get back up to the inflation target would be to spend X billion, 20 billion, 30 billion, in this helicopter money drop, this money finance deficits. But you'd locate the decision of that in an independent central bank. The government would have to think about how it used that money. I don't think you can leave that sort of distributional issue uh, to an independent central bank. But I think you have to locate the decision on how much within an independent central bank. But your point then is, yeah, but even if that is the case, can you do it in one country? I think the answer is it depends on the size of the country. If you were a small, open economy, and in particular, an emerging market economy, if you were Thailand or Malaysia, I would be incredibly wary of this because the response that it could occur through the foreign exchange market uh, through a depreciation of the currency, which then generates inflationary expectations, which are self-fulfilling, I think would severely limit it. And that simply illustrates the point that small, open, emerging market economies, the sad fact is they are in many ways constrained from being able to use macroeconomic tools that are available to others. At the other end, if I were America, if I were the USA, I would be completely relaxed about that. The impact of movements of the US dollar rate on the American economy is just much, much smaller because it's a continental scale uh, economy in which exports and imports are not all that much as a percent of GDP. Uh, there is also the fact that as a reserve currency status of the US, people are just not likely to dump it. And I am absolutely confident that if the US had been able to agree back in 2009, clearly between the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, a controlled amount of permanent monetary creation, I don't think there would have been an overshooting problem uh, of that sort. I'm also convinced that if the European Union, the Euro Eurozone could agree this, they'd be okay. We're in a very interesting intermediate size on that spectrum. I think Japan, US, the Eurozone, if I were them, I'd be relaxed about doing it. In the UK, you would need to have a high degree of confidence and credibility, which may suggest a sort of slightly Nixon in China effect there. Mm. Uh, that to be absolutely blunt, it would be far easier for George Osborne to say that he was doing this than for Jeremy Corbyn to say that he was doing this <laughs> without generating those knock-on expectational effects. I mean, there's a related point, which is whether one should reserve this tool for moments of acute crisis. So we would have done this in 2008 and 2009, um, but uh, just because we've got a period of slightly below par growth, we wouldn't resort to it in, 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 in those circumstances. Is this, in your view, something which one should only reserve <laughs> for the moment of catastrophe? I want it to be only for emergency circumstances because if it is only for emergency circumstances, extreme circumstances, that makes it easier to believe politically that we will use it, put it away, and not overuse it. 
whereas I think if you used it every single year, money finance, you would create a greater danger that having done 1% of GDP on it for five years, a politician would say, well, 1% seemed okay, why don't we make it 2%, why don't we make it 3%, why don't we make it 4%. The regular use, um, I think, creates an increase in the political risk. But it is quite interesting that in Milton Friedman's 1948 article, he was talking about this as a tool of public policy year after year after year. And one of the things I struggle with in the book is that although I don't want to propose that we could, should use it year after year, if you believe the hypothesis that Larry Summers and others have been putting forward about secular stagnation, it might be required. So the secular stagnation hypothesis, at the core of it is this. It says, even before the crisis, look at what had happened to real interest rates. Real index interest rates, even before the crisis, had come down 30-year rates from, say, 3.5% in 1990 to 1% by 2007, and then now minus 1%. So what's going on? Economics suggests that that's probably a change in the balance between desired investment and desired savings, right? We're trying to save more than we need in investment. One of the possibilities is that the modern advanced economy simply doesn't need as much investment as it used to. And that's because in an environment where we investment is very intensive of information and communication technology, the cost of new capital assets keeps falling. And there's IMF figures that show that the average cost of new equipment that goes into factories or retailers or restaurants, etc., the average price of that has come down by 30% <coughs> relative to the normal average prices you know, for the things that we buy and consume uh, over the last 20 years. If that is the case, it could be that we grow our economies without much new investment, but we still want to save, and that we end up with an equilibrium real interest rate, which is actually negative. Uh, in which case, we may have to either, as Kenneth Rogoff has suggested, abolish paper money and permanently run with negative interest rates, and Andy Haldane of the Bank of England also somewhat suggested that in a speech in Northern Ireland about a month ago. Or we might have to consider using monetary finance on a regular basis. So I don't go all the way there, but in addition to this huge problem created by the debt overhang, which has created, as it were, a one-off situation that we've got to deal with, it is at least possible that something which is making that even more difficult to get out of, is some longer-term trends which were in place even before the crisis and have intensified yet, and which we are only beginning to understand their importance for the nature uh, of our economy. And the role of information and communications technology in particular, and I devote some of the book to this, but I think it needs to be further explored, uh, may be changing some fundamental things in the relationships in economics, uh, which we're, as I say, only just getting to grips with. I mean, I think it's worth just uh, uh, sort of um, drawing out some of the sort of false distinctions between um, quantitative easing and outright money financing. Um, I mean, for example, we've got 375 billion of QE in this country. Um, as Adair said, it's not immediately clear um, quite how direct an effect that's had on economic activity. What we have seen is it, is it has significantly increased asset prices. If you think that encourages consumption, then it's had a positive effect. Of course, the, the, uh, you know, a corollary of that is it has increased the wealth of the wealthiest um, and widened you know, the inequalities, which, as Adair points out, are closely associated with millions of people who don't have very much money borrowing too much um, to, to keep their lifestyles going. So it's by no means clear that the current QE is particularly desirable, but more importantly than that, there is also another you know, completely phony distinction, uh, which is that somehow you know, QE, QE money creation is demonstrably debt that will be repaid versus money financing in this sort, which won't, because, I mean, as you probably know, the Bank of England, when the government's debt comes up for repayment, the Bank of England 
doesn't get the money back from the government, it simply buys more government debt at the moment. In other words, it is rolling over the debt because it doesn't believe the economy is strong enough for it to stop lending to the government. And what's more, any profit or interest it makes on all of this gets passed back to the government anyway. So this is very cheap, long-term money for the government. So in a sense, the distinction between what Adair is talking about and what we've got at the moment is much more notional than practical. Well, I think except with one difference, and, and, and here's the interesting point. Let's look at it in Japan. Yeah. In Japan, the government owes about 250% of GDP. Now, the IMF figures say, don't focus on 250%, focus on a figure about 150%, because about 100% of it is owned by things like the Social Security Fund. But let's focus on 150%. 150% is still very, very high. It's almost as high as Greece, it's higher than Italy's, and it keeps on going up and up. Of that 150%, the Bank of Japan already owns 44 out of the 150. And it is buying Japanese government bonds at a pace whereby <coughs> the end of 2017, the 150 might have gone up to about 170, but the Bank of Japan will then own about 90 out of the 170 because the Bank of Japan is every year buying more JGBs, uh, Japanese government bonds, than the government of Japan issues. And you can see logically there'll be some point in about 2022 where every single Japanese government bond will be owned either by the Social Security Fund or by the Bank of Japan. Now, is that permanent monetization? Well, at one level, you know, what's the difference? The only difference might be is that if in the course of this you keep on telling the Japanese people, yes, but you are going to eventually have to pay back this debt, and if the Bank of Japan keeps on telling the markets, oh, I'm just holding this debt temporarily, I'm going to sell it back to the market, and at that time the Bank of Japan will have to pay back the debt, then that expectation could be driving the government of Japan to keep trying to tighten f fiscal policy in order to get rid of this debt, which it actually owns to itself, which it keeps on trying to do by increasing the sales tax. And the fact that you keep telling the Japanese people that this is the case may mean that every time a Japanese person gets a bit more money in their pocket, they say, oh, well, I better save it uh, in order to pay for this terrible debt burden that I keep on being told I've got. So what I argue is that Japan, I mean, let me, let me be blunt about Japan. Japan is an environment where we don't, you don't just have to debate should we or should we not monetize, eventually we win, right? They win. Um, the Japanese government cannot, will not, can never, will never pay back its debt in the normal sense of the word repay. The Bank of Japan will never sell back this debt. Now, th that's a will statement, not a should statement, quite separate from whether I think that's a good idea or not, it's just going to occur, get used to it, but I think it's a good idea. And so I argue that sometime in the next five years, there is going to be an overt permanent monetization of this debt, a recognition that it is permanent, and I do think it'll make a difference <coughs> in the sense of it then removes a constraint which the <coughs> government of Japan currently believes it is under to tighten its fiscal stance, and the removal of that fiscal uh, th th that belief that it's got to tighten the fiscal stance, I think will make some sort of a difference. No, no, I'm sure it'll make a difference. I, I, all I was saying is that if you're a purist about these things, um, then you should be deeply concerned about, you know, how, the, how, the, you know, how Japan behaves and how we behave in terms of how, you know, where, we are, we, where we are already. I mean, you're absolutely right. The extraordinary thing, I mean, literally extraordinary thing, um, is that behavior is affected by this conceit that somehow this debt's going to be repaid. I mean, the c and I, you know, I think it is a conceit. Um, but um, it is extraordinary, as I say, how, how, how perceptions create reality in that sense. Another interesting debate that you have in the book is about the structure of banks. And um, you say that, do, 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 do you know what, you all sort of, people who are obsessed with things like fractional reserve banking and all that, or do, do uh, I, I want to, so basically, we, 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 have a, we have a system in which uh, banks, as uh, Adair pointed out, can create money 
out of thin air. And basically, if, if anybody makes a deposit in a bank, they can then lend it on, it gets lent on again, it gets lent on again, it gets lent on again, and every deposit creates new money. And it's, you know, and, and bizarrely, as Adair points out, despite the fact that we've been living with this system more or less forever, almost no mainstream economists took any account of it when devising their economic models or in describing what shocks might happen to the system. But what you point out is that one of the problems with this system is that it allows money to be created and astonishing proportions of it, 50-60% goes into pushing up the price of particularly residential property, but assets in general, in a way that delivers, frankly, very little economic benefit to the vast majority of people. And in fact, you're also responsible for this terrible transfer of uh, wealth to the older generation and away from young people, which is one of the great scandals of our age. Now, Having identified fractional reserve banking as being at the heart of you know, one of the great economic evils of our time, you then but say, you then look at the argument for going to a rather different system of credit creation where banks would simply be banned from lending in that way. They would be, their entire job would be to look after our savings, but money create or but lending could only occur between two parties, one of whom has got some savings and another person wants some debt, but there'd be no intermediation by banks, but the supply of money would be regulated by essentially the central bank creating money at a steady pace in line with what you think the underlying growth of the economy would be. Now, many people would, many people have argued this is an altogether better system, less risky system for generating income. Why, in the end, did you d decide not to go for that radical solution? Why don't I go all the way? Uh, and it's quite interesting, some of the economists in the past who did go all the way. So in the aftermath of the cataclysm of 1930 to 33, when the US banking system collapses and produces the Great Depression, a number of uh, important uh, economists, Frank Knight, uh, Irving Fisher, Henry Simons, presented to President Roosevelt a thing called the Chicago Plan. And they basically argued that until and unless we essentially abolished banks as we know them, we were going to have instability. I mean, at the front of Chapter 12, I quote from Henry Simons, private initiative has been allowed too much freedom in determining the character of our financial structure and undirecting changes in the quantity of money. In the very nature of the system, banks will flood the economy with money during booms and precipitate futile efforts at general liquidation thereafter. Now, what's really a state interesting about that statement, private initiative has been allowed too much freedom, is that Henry Simons, in pretty much every other aspect of his economic theory, is an extreme free marketer. He is one of the founding fathers of the Chicago School of Free Market Economics. And yet he's saying, we've just allowed too much private initiative in the role of creating money. Essentially, these guys create believe that we'd, we'd made a sort of category error. We had treated money as being like restaurant meals or cars or clothes as something which should be subject to competition rather than understanding that it was a, a social construct and a social reality. So they argued for 100% reserve banking. And as you may know, there are various people, particularly in Britain, particularly organized by a very interesting group who I've spoken at several times called Positive Money, who have argued we should actually do this. And as Robert has said, if you did this, all that a bank would do, it would be like sort of national savings and investment, right? It would, be, it would have a set of claims on the government or on the central bank and you'd have a set of savings claims against it or current account savings claims, but it certainly wouldn't be lending money either to householders or to businesses. That would be done by a set of non-bank relations. What I admit in the book is that there is an intellectual clarity to that analysis that we have to take seriously, but I still draw back from that degree of radicalism. I, I sort of struggled with my conscience as to whether I was right to draw back from that uh, or whether I just didn't want to be seen as, you know, have gone completely AWOL uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, the conventional wisdom. 
But I do think, and I set them out, a set of reasons why I wouldn't go all the way. I think there is, it goes back to, I think there is a role for debt contracts and more debt contracts than would be created if we didn't have fractional reserve banks. I think there is a role for what is called maturity transformation. Maturity transformation is a, it's a bit of a confidence trick uh, by which banks lend longer than the money they take in. They can lend 20 years and then promise on the liability side an instantly available uh, 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 deposit. But as Walter Badgett argued, this may be a confidence trick which played its role in the, um, in the mobilization of capital in the Industrial Revolution, etc. So I'm wary of going all the way. I also think that sometimes in public policy you just have to accept that we are where we are and it's incredibly difficult, given where we are, to go to 100% reserve banking without having a plan to get rid of huge amounts of debt in the economy, which you can't set out without creating some massive winners and losers. And there's a very fine paper by a man called Michael L uh, Kumhoff, who, whom I respect a lot, but I, when he sets out the transition plan, I still end up saying, Michael, but somebody's won and lost here. You know, it's not as simple as you suggest. So for a variety of reasons, I say we can't go all the way. But what I do say is this. Once you've realized that there are instability dangers from fractional reserve banks, and once you understand that it's not mad to propose 100% reserve banks, you then realize that we can pick any point along that spectrum. We can have fractional reserve banks, but we don't have to allow the fraction to be as incredibly low as we have allowed it for many years. And we can have a banking system which both in terms of its capital ratios on the liability side of the balance sheet has much higher capital ratios. And on the asset side, we can put bank into the central bank toolkit what are called reserve asset requirements at the central bank, and we can make them 5% of the balance sheet or 10% of the balance sheet or 15% of the balance sheet. <laughs> if you made them 15% of the balance sheet, you'd essentially be having, let's say, 10% of your banking system was 100% reserves, mm -hmm. and the other bit was fractional reserves with a 5% ratio. And I think once you realize that we can pick any point along that spectrum, that's essentially where I locate my policy proposals, not going all the way to 100% reserve banking, but a really quite radical set of proposals as to how tightly we should constrain the credit creation processes. Now, just a bit, I'm going to throw it over to you, but I'm now going to use the prerogative of sitting here to say I want you to answer three or four topical questions and the, with one word, though. You've got a one-word answer to these, <laughs> right? And, and so... Um, Corbyn's QE for the people, the central bank land lending to a national investment bank, which would in turn invest in infrastructure, good or bad? Technically possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now, remember, you've said quite a lot in the book about inequality. George Osborne's cuts to tax credits, good or bad? Bad. You heard that? No. Um, <laughs> Gordon, now, you're, you're very, very uh, down on the tax advantages of debt over equity. So Gordon Brown's abolition of the tax credit on dividends, good or bad? Um, actually, that was, yeah, uh, no, that was a step in the wrong direction, yeah, because it increased the uh, tax advantage of debt by removing a tax advantage. Yes, that's bad. Right. That's right. right. Okay. There we go. Three very clear answers. Um, now, anybody any questions? Uh, we've got, have we got microphones? We have. So this chap over here. And would you mind um, just uh, saying who you are? My name is Gérard Legrain. You have claimed support from Don Friedman. You have balanced your statement that you were in favor of monetizing debt by saying that only the big guys could do it, they could do it once, and uh, not an ongoing basis. And then I ask my question, which is, the mighty US had to borrow in Deutschmark under President Carter, 
And we've seen the price of gold, at, I think, at $7,000 an ounce. What do you answer to that? I'm trying to remember. Why did the U.S. I'm not sure the U.S. did have to borrow in Deutschmarks under President Carter. I mean, at least relative to the sterling at that time, of course, the, the value was going way, way up. I think what may have been happening at that time was that, if I remember rightly, the dollar was going down against the Deutschmark, but essentially what was happening is that the Deutschmark, the Bundesbank, was deliberately buying dollars in order to prevent the appreciation of the Deutschmark because it didn't want to undermine uh, the competitiveness of German industry. There is a wonderful, wonderful irony, uh, which I remember somebody told me, it, it was a US Federal Reserve uh, person who had once pointed out to the Germans in the uh, 1990s that they had a record of being absolutely clear that the Bundesbank should never, ever buy uh, German government bonds uh, but a record of continually buying the clearly less credit-worthy bonds of all other countries around the world uh, as an exercise of foreign exchange uh, management, uh, which actually has the wonderful irony that if the Germans ever left the Eurozone, I'm absolutely certain the Bundesbank would end up buying Spanish, Italian, and Greek government bonds <laughs> in order to prevent an appreciation of uh, the Deutschmark against the, new dra the drachma and the lira. So I, I'm, I'm not sure, and, and as for gold, I don't attach much importance to gold at all. I mean, I, I, you know, this is a very arbitrary thing. It, it goes up sometimes when we have high inflationary expectations. It, you know, what is a gold in our financial system? Um, you know, it's an arbitrarily chosen store of value. So I, it, I, I think we are in deeply deflationary times. I admit that even the US in the 1980s had reasonably high inflation, but nothing like 1970s, but nothing like as high as we have at the moment. So I would repeat, I think the US, if it wanted to now, I, I, I'm absolutely sure it could get away with a monetization option without producing you know, a self-reinforcing effect. H having said that, just to go back to a question Robert said earlier, the ideal, and it's interesting to know what the ideal is, even if you have no dream that it could ever occur. The ideal in 2009 mm. would have been a globally agreed simultaneous money finance deficit by all the major advanced economies together, thus completely removing the danger that you would produce some of these disruptive foreign exchange effects. But again, it's useful in economics to set out what the ideal is to keep your thinking clear even if you then recognize that, you know, the political reality, it, that's simply not going to occur. Yeah. Um, there's a chap here with the... Uh, okay. uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. I believe the only reason why we do keep having these banking horrors is because of the terms we use, like financial crisis and Great Depression. It implies it's a financial issue and not a poli political one. If we were to use terms like economic rape of the working man and woman, this would bring it back into a political and be seen as a deliberate crime against this group, who are the only people who have ever suffered from this. Also, this group What's could the question? What's the question? What's also, this group collectively seek justice. Would you change your language accordingly so that people could seek justice and see it as a crime? Thank you. Well, no, I'm not. Well, first of all, the book's written already, so I sort of can't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't change the wording. Um, uh, uh, I guess I'm wary. I, I, I take the point that one mustn't address these issues as if they are purely technical issues Political away issues. from the role of power within our economy, inequality in the economy. My own style is to believe that there's a value in, a, in getting the technical understanding uh, clear. Um, and I think it's still reasonable to say things like, there is a financial crisis, and when we have those financial crises, the impact is highly unequal and falls on the less well-off within our society. I'm also very, very clear in the book that I do share the hypothesis that part of the reason why our economies have become so credit-intensive is the rise in inequality. 
and I explore that in particularly in relation to the US, where for 30 years, the bottom quintile or quartile of the American population have basically received no real wage increases at all, while the uh, salaries, incomes of the top 1% have gone up three times. And I think there is a valid argument that in that environment, you could have a problem of demand deficiency, because essentially richer people can't spend all the money they've got, and so the system only balances. They have a mar higher marginal propensity to save uh, 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 than poorer people, and the system only balances if you take the savings of the very top end and lend it to middle-income and lower-income people. Uh, that was a hypothesis that Raghu Rajan set out in his very fine book, uh, Fault Lines, where he had a wonderful phrase uh, for what happened in the US um, in the 1990s and 2000s. He said, look, we had this rise in inequality. We had a political system and a set of economic policies where we either didn't know what to do about it or we didn't want to do anything fundamental about it. So our only response to it was let them eat credit. Um, and that was the subprime mortgage boom. And then it came to an end. And uh, when it came to an end, the twist was that the process of it coming to end actually increased inequality, both because the policies we used to deal with it, like quantitative easing, increased asset prices, and because there's a phenomenon, when you have these amazing credit and asset price cycles, when you have the downswing, it's the people who are most highly leveraged who actually get wiped out, who lose their houses, and who lose the ability to stay in the game for the next upswing. And again, a very fine book called House of Debt uh, by Asif Mian and Amir Sufi has illustrated that when you get these cycles, um, they are bad for the less well-off. So I hope I've dealt with those fundamental issues, even if I haven't used the language that you prefer. So if you check at the back. Yeah. Thank you, Lord Turner, for a, a brilliant uh, talk. Um, j just um, looking at the solution you've come up with, which um, essentially, as I understand it, is to increase demand in the economy. Um, if I take a stroll down to the macroeconomic <coughs> end of the corridor, um, Britain has low productivity growth and more or less you know, close to full employment. And I wonder if this low productivity growth isn't a long-term problem, given that we're now largely a service economy and have an aging population. So uh, is that perhaps more the problem rather than purely financial issues? Well, it's a very good challenge. And, you know, in most of good economic thinking, there isn't an either or, right? I, I do believe that there is, as Martin Wolf would put it, a chronic demand deficiency, a deficiency of nominal demand across the world. And the way I would illustrate that is, I think there's a reasonable hypothesis that modern economies work best if we have, on average over time, nominal demand in the economy growing at, say, something like 4%. 4% makes possible a rate of inflation, on average over time, of maybe 2%, and a real growth of maybe 2%, which we might think is line with potential. And before the crisis, we were achieving, uh, it was growing at, uh, actually at about 5% per annum. Since 2008, nominal GDP in the UK has grown on average over the last seven years by 2.9%, in the US by 2.9%, uh, in the Eurozone by 1% per annum, and uh, in Japan it's gone down by 0.1% per annum. If you add it up across the world, I think there's a reasonable hypothesis that part of the problem we have is a lack of nominal uh, demand. Um, that does not exclude the fact that there might be also some very important supply side factors that we need to look at. And this issue of are we suffering in the UK, why do we have this low <coughs> productivity growth in the UK, and what happens to productivity growth in a service economy, uh, you know, those are important issues, and I certainly don't exclude them. And in fact, as it happens, apart from back in 2009, and this somewhat expands upon my uh, uh, two-word answer, uh, where I broke the rules uh, to Robert's question on Corbynomics, apart from back in 2009, I would say that in the subsequent years, 
the UK was probably the country where it was least obvious that we should have done money finance deficits because in 2010, 11, 12, our inflation rate was actually running ahead of target and our biggest problem then seemed to be that for any given increase in nominal demand, more of it was going into inflation and less going into real output. I am much clearer that in the Eurozone, in the US and Japan, there is a huge problem of deficient demand, and in particular in the Eurozone and Japan, and that there they definitely need to consider these monetary finance options. So I don't exclude that possibility, and I simply say, you know, <coughs> these are not exclusive, and, you know, economics should engage with both of those problems, both the demand and the supply side. Uh, great. There's actually a lady just in the middle there with her hand up, long hair. There we go. Terrified I was going to be discriminating in, uh, in, in favour of, you know, <laughs> us, white middle-aged men all night. So thank, thank goodness. Thanks. Um, I'm Sarah Lyle, and I work at the New Economics Foundation. Um, and you've been giving a very helpful macroeconomic picture, but I was just wondering if it would be helpful if you might give us your proposal from the perspective of the household. So if you imagine someone who's, say, got £9,000 worth of unsecured debt, which is I think is the average at the moment, and um, maybe they're on a median income, what would the monetization of debt mean for, th for that kind of individual? Okay, well, let me, let me try and arg answer. I won't come I'll come back to the monetization of debt if we, I I if we went down that option, but I think you raised some other important issues about you know, what should we be doing about other aspects in our society. I, the, the reason, uh, uh, Robert asked me a question about the tax credits and uh, inequality. I think that there are some huge underlying tendencies to inequality, which I think, I think, and one can never be absolutely certain, have quite a lot to do with information and communication technology. I am convinced by the arguments of people like Henry Eric uh, Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee in what I think is a very fine book, uh, The Second Machine Age, that there's something about information and communication technology which is both delivering huge economic returns to the bright software creators and entrepreneurs who either you know, are just cleverer than other people or just luckier than other people, i.e. they get there first with uh, the new uh, internet site or piece of software that establishes a network externality-based monopoly or a brand name monopoly. Huge returns at the upper end to the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Bill Gates, the, the you know, Jeff Bezos, etc. And at the other end, I think we are probably in the middle of and about to continue to see waves of robotization and automation which extend what has been happening in manufacturing to increasing swathes of the service sector. And I think, therefore, we're sitting on a natural tendency towards increasing inequality, which, by the way, I don't think we can entirely undo but at least we should not make worse and we should lean somewhat against. How do we lean against it? I think we can lean against it partly by things like a higher minimum wage. And if you'd asked me, was uh, George Osborne right to push the minimum wage up, I'd have said yes. I was chair of the Low Pay Commission from 2003 to 2006. And those four years were actually the only four years uh, of the Low Pay Commission where we increased the minimum wage significantly above the increase in average earnings. And I think there is a potential to take up the minimum wage. But it's not limitless. It's not limitless because the more you push up the minimum wage, the more that employers will seek for potential to substitute capital for labor. And it used to be the case that we could assume that in a lot of the face-to-face -face service activities where the low-paid jobs are concentrated, there was only a small capacity, unlike in manufacturing, to substitute capital for labor. But I think that is increasingly changing, that in retailing and hotels and restaurants and security and cleaning, we are increasingly seeing the capacity to use bits of machinery instead of labor. So yes, we can do it partly through the minimum wage. The bit that I'm very unclear of, that we can do it through skills. What I call the nice, rich, liberal answer to inequality is always skills. If you read 
an article in the nice, rich, liberal papers which I read. Um, of course, I read The Economist and The Financial Times. And you know, I've got nothing against nice, rich liberals. Many of my friends are nice, rich liberals. <laughs> Wouldn't mind if a nice, rich liberal moved into my street. I think there are several of them already, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you know, if you read an Economist article on inequality, it fundamentally goes, there's a huge problem with inequality. What do we do about it? What do we do about it? Well, it's obvious that we shouldn't do redistribution through higher taxes. What we should do is increase people's skills. I think there's something going on in our economy and our labor markets where increasing skills is an inadequate answer, and therefore we need <coughs> to do it through a degree of risk redistribution, minimum wages. But because you can't push minimum wages up relentlessly, because then you will induce a substitution of capital for labor, we need tax credits as well. I think we are in an environment where the equilibrium free market price for low-skilled labor has been reduced by information and communication technology and probably will continue to be reduced by information and communication technology and that we need a social compact which understands that we've got to find a way through some concept of citizenship income or whatever to make sure that those people are well looked after. We simply cannot allow uh, their total income in society be to be determined by their equilibrium real wage rates. Because although over the very long term, over the very long term, productivity increases raise all boats, there's a lot of evidence from economic history that the very long term is very long term indeed. There's a very fine uh, piece of work by some economic historians that point out that all the way from 1800 to 1850, the Industrial Revolution delivers nothing whatsoever to the English working class. Uh, and it's only in the second half of the 19th century that there is, as it were, a, a trickle-down effect. These things, we have very long sways, and we need a policy to deal with it. On monetization, on monetization, <coughs> if we were to go down that route, I would have the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England make the decision on the maximum amount which is allowable, because I want to locate it within an inflation <coughs> target so that we guard against the danger that we do too much. But it would then be for the government to decide where to spend it. And they could then decide either that there was public investment which would improve the supply side of the economy or that you should use it to address you know, particular social problems. The only point to say, though, is ideally when you use monetization, if you're using it as a one-off exercise, you've got to use it on a form of public expenditure which is credibly one-off. A one-off tax cut is credibly one-off. A increase in public investment can be credibly one-off, but an increase in social security benefits is not credibly one-off because you'll never be able to remove them. And that's something you need, need to think about, about the political economy of monetization. Um, so there was a chap in the middle here. While he's getting the microphone, it's another one-word answer, please. Um, more pernicious, uh, creditor Germany or debtor UK? <laughs> Siamese twins. <laughs> it's two words, you failed. <laughs> this chap here. Thank you. Uh, the high degree of fractional uh, reserve, what will it do to credit creation and the ends to the economic growth? What, what, what did fractional reserve that you talk about, high degree of uh, fractional reserve, what will it do to credit, credit creation and hence to the economic growth? Yeah, I don't think it will slow economic growth. I think we do not need as much credit growth as we have had to grow economic growth. <laughs> now, this is a crucial issue within the book, and it, I engage in it by the, the following stylized fact as um, economists like to say it. It's a fact which is roughly right, but don't push me on the last decimal point. Um, stylized fact of the advanced economies before the crisis for 20 years is that the central banks have done pretty well at getting nominal GDP to grow at about 4 or 5% per annum, relatively stable economies, you know, relatively uh, growth in line with potential. But year after year, on average, credit nominal credit was growing somewhere in the 10 to 15% rate. Which means, of course, that leverage was rising because the numerator is rising faster than the denominator. 
And if that goes on forever, eventually the system will blow up. That's not an equilibrium. That is a system which is moving from one uh, state to another, uh, but it's not an equilibrium. The question is, at the time, it appeared like we needed that credit growth in order to achieve nominal GDP growth because the credit growth we must have thought had something to do with the interest rate. If we'd raised the interest rate, we'd have slowed down the credit growth. But our theory tells us if we'd slowed down, increased the interest rate, we'd have also have slowed down the nominal GDP growth. So we seem to end up with what I describe as a conundrum, which is we appeared to need nominal credit growth of 10 to 15 percent to achieve nominal GDP growth of 5 percent. But if that's the case, eventually the system uh, produces a, a crisis. I argue that we can have, <coughs> and just for those who love uh, uh, you know, uh, economic theory, I'm sure there are some here. This is, after all, the London School of Economics. Uh, if that is true, it means we do not have an equilibrium uh, in a monetary economy as against in a sort of Balrasian uh, real exchange uh, economy. And a lot of our propositions of uh, equilibrium would not be right. I argue that we can and we need to have credit growth in line with nominal GDP growth. We don't need it permanently higher. The clue to it is that most of our credit growth is not about nominal GDP growth because most of it is financing transactions which are not nominal GDP transactions. They are neither consumption nor are they our investment. They are the purchase of assets that already exist. And I think this is a hugely unexplored area of modern macroeconomics, which has been opened up by excellent empirical work, for instance, in Clinton's fantastic work, which INET has actually helped to fund by uh, Oscar Yorda, uh, Maurice Schullerich, and, and, and Alan Taylor. And I would, you know, for anybody who's interested, I'd push you towards that empirical work about what is credit really used for. But once you realize that most credit is used to fund the purchase of assets locationally specific assets, irreproducible assets, positional goods, positional assets, which already exist, you realize that if we are clever enough in our regulatory regimes, we can cut off, we can moderate that credit growth without moderating the credit growth which is relevant to nominal GDP transactions. And that is the basic argument that I make in the book. Now, I've got time for one more question. Uh, there's a chap, I think you've been wanting to ask a question for some time. Uh, before we do it, though, one, one more uh, one-word answer. Um, and uh, I have to say, you have given this answer in the book, so if you duck it now, I will give the answer that you give. So the question is, um, with no outright money financing in the Eurozone, does the Eurozone survive? No. Hi, P. Ketwell. I'm a nice, rich liberal from Marco Capital Europe. Um, you said that the reason not to go to 100% reserve banking is that there would be some serious winners and losers. But what has been done in the last seven or eight years, there has been some serious winners and losers. I'm a winner, I'm very happy, but I'm not sure if that's a good outcome here. I, I accept that the argument that there would be w big winners and losers is not in itself an argument against doing it. But as I say, when I looked at Michael Kuntov's, I mean, I essentially, when you move from a fractional reserve banking system and you want to create a new 100% uh, 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 reserve banking system, you, you've got to work out what you do with all this debt that we've already created. And in Michael Kuntov's paper, which I think is one of the, the best thought out, and I, I, you know, I do very much uh, respect it, and I've endorsed people and said, read it, even though I disagree with bits of the final conclusions, Michael has to engineer a way of writing off huge amounts of mortgage debt. He has to have a whole load of people who currently have mortgage debt who no longer have mortgage debt because you've got to take the banks off the, uh, off the bank. <laughs> so unless you're going to hand that mortgage debt to another institution, and it's quite difficult to hand you know, uh, 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 an asset to another uh, institution. Uh, no, well, you've got to write it off you know, unless you've got to uh, take a liability somewhere else. You can't hand a liability to someone. I, I, you, you end up with a slightly intractable problem. So I think there is an intractability. Did you say you were an auto liberal? Oh. Uh, uh, what? French? Rich. I oh, was rich liberal. Well heeled. Oh, okay. 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 No, I thought you were, I thought you were right. Okay. I, I, I thought you were an auto liberal, which is also a very, very interesting German point of view. Again, for which I have considerable respect. 
but with which I do not entirely agree. But we, that, for that, another day. Now, look, I'm awfully sorry uh, that we couldn't get to all of your uh, questions. Um, we partly have to draw this to, to a close uh, for sort of selfish reasons, which is the Bank of England has said something moderately interesting about the UK and UK's membership of the EU, and I've actually got to go back and uh, make something of it for the 10 o'clock news, um, for which, <laughs> so blame Carney uh, uh, for drawing to a close, but really important announcement, there will be copies of Adair's brilliant book, uh, to be had at the back, and if you ask nicely, you can even have a rare unsigned copy. <laughs>